welcome to uh, our live webinar. I'm Katarin. And I'm Pire. We are going to talk about uh, how to scale globally with uh, Rainer Sterfeld and Sten Tamgivi. But uh, we before we go into the topic, uh, the webinar is hosted by Talent Hub uh, Recruitment Agency. So Talent Hub is a recruitment agency that builds winning teams uh, for high growth startups through value-based recruitment and headhunting. Uh, no worries. Um, so our mission is to provide uh, this type of content to scale um, in a scaling phase uh, companies and startups. So if you're interested, then you can follow us in LinkedIn and push the like button. And today we're joined by Rainer Stenfeld and Sven Damgivi. Uh, Rainer is an engineer uh, and entrepreneur turned investor with over two decades of experience in technology, um, businesses and products, uh, building technology, business and products across uh, Silicon Valley, Europe uh, and Japan. He was the co-founder and CEO of Planet OS that was uh, acquired by Intertrust and moved back to Estonia in 2019 to build Nordic Ninja, uh, one of the, lar well, the largest Japanese venture capital fund in Europe. Sten Tamgivi is the co-founder of Plura Platform, a venture fund established in 2021 with a focus on investing in early stage technology startups in Europe. Sten has got extensive experience as an entrepreneur and executive of companies such as Teleport and Skype. Welcome both. Great to be here. Yeah. Uh, to get <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for us to get started, how do you position yourself uh, compared to other VCs? Uh, what makes Nordic Ninja and Plural Platform so unique? Sten. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, we're positioning that we're not VCs. Uh, oh. <laughs> it, Good. It, but, but basically what it means is that the problem that we're solving for Europe, uh, and we're extremely bullish about tech in Europe, specifically uh, is that if you look at more developed markets like for example the US about 60% of partners at the leading VC firms have actually built a company before and in Europe that percentage is miserable like 8 to 12% so that basically means that 90% of people backing early stage companies in Europe have never built one and we started looking into that and, and uh, looking at how we can attract. So in, in, a word, in a way, it's also a talent problem to solve. How can we create the mechanism and attract people who have built and scaled companies before and give them the tools and means to actually go and invest in startups uh, as more than just an angel? So with plural, uh, the people that we call only half joking, the unemployables, because uh, uh, no single startup probably can hire them. And for some reason, VC funds haven't been able to hire them. And, and they can now go and actually lead a multi-million euro around in seed array and get very, very involved in a few companies a year where they, they actually want to be hands-on and, and help to sort of change the trajectory of the company and, and sort of pass on the knowledge they've acquired as uh, hands-on entrepreneurs and operators themselves. So uh, we've, we felt that that is missing in Europe and, and now here we are. Fantastic. Stan? Right. Right. Oh, sorry, Rainer. <laughs> sorry, right. thank you. Uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, so with Nordic Ninja, we have uh, uh, a unique position, not only in Europe, but also in the world. Uh, most Japanese funds, when you look at them around the world, they are, well, Japanese. And our fund has been uh, started as a 50-50 partnership between Japan and Europe from the very beginning. 50% uh, of the team is Japanese and, and 50 is European. And uh, one of the uh, interesting aspects there is that um, we have, as, as Stan mentioned, um, you know, company builders uh, and former founders. Three out of four partners are former founders, executives, and uh, uh, you know, in addition to that, we are quite engineering heavy. So, um, you know, if eight to twelve percent have former company building experience, then maybe even fewer of those have been working as engineers as well. So, uh, we have that going for us. And then maybe, in addition to that. Um, this is a, an international fund that was started here locally, founded in, in Helsinki first, but we have a team here in Tallinn and Helsinki and Stockholm. And so if you think about international funds that are global, what you often see is they would parachute in, invest in a certain team and then leave. They don't contribute to the local ecosystem. And we've been an international fund that came here, moved here, I moved here from Silicon Valley, our, uh, Japanese partners moved to Helsinki from Tokyo 
And so it's an international fund that was established here, uh, but invests throughout the Northern Europe uh, and, and helps to scale globally, but then develops the local ecosystem. So it has this Japanese angle and then the engineering founder angle pulled into one. And, and then as it happens, yes, it is the largest Japanese VC in Europe, but that's, I think, more of a secondary, secondary trait. And that's why you are here, because you are both founders and now investors, and uh, we all want to know your experience uh, from both sides and, uh, and talk about uh, scaling and how to scale uh, companies and how to prepare for that. So uh, let's start with what is scaling for you, Sten? Mm, well, it's basically like if you if you think about sp specifically scaling the business uh, as in a group of people and, and hiring more people, I think the very first sort of misconception that especially young founders often have is that the, that the hiring more people feels like a, a result of your success. But in a way, actually scaling is in a counterintuitively, intu when you need to hire more people, it comes from, from your failure to scale otherwise. So, so in a way, if you automate the systems, if you find ways how to create leverage, if you are 10 times more efficient than an incumbent in some market, I don't know, you're building a, an insurance startup and you have way less ballast than an established insurance firm has, then you actually shouldn't be hiring that many people. But uh, if you take a very, very careful approach and, and build the right systems and tools and apply technologies, you still need the smart people to do that. And so, so mostly I think the, um, the scaling um, uh, should be driven by the, the, the growth in your actual business activity, that you have more users, more customers, more, uh, more uh, money moving through your systems, and that means that you need to hire more smart people to manage all that. Uh, but what makes maybe startup companies a little bit trickier and more uh, have, ha they have more specific issues is that if you're, for example, building a services company like a recruitment agency, you probably get the customers first and then hire more people to a team. In startups, that hiring and scaling sometimes is pre uh, like front-loaded, mm -hmm. that you actually have a plan of having a million users two years down the road, but you need to hire a lot of people now to build all the systems that lead you there. So it's this sort of heavy R&D and heavy technology component just I think makes an average startup think about scaling worries way earlier than, than maybe more calmly growing companies would. And so this front loading is also prone for making a lot of mistakes and, and going too fast or going too slow or hiring the wrong people and like all of this. Yes, and the mistakes we are going to talk about. So when you do the scaling part and, uh, and you have done also the grooming uh, the companies from uh, zero to 100 yourself. So what have you seen uh, um, the others are doing? What mistakes are people making uh, when uh, growing companies uh, from, let's say, 10 to 100, uh, Rainer? Maybe before I even answer that, I think just to add to what Stan was saying earlier, I think it's uh, uh, quite important to uh, be self-aware as founders or even as investors, what does scale look like? And, you know, uh, going from 10 to 20 or 20 to 100, you know, 100 to 500 is a different uh, beast. Something happens in organizational management practices after 500. Um, but then, you know, I, I used to work for also for ABB, which has 130,000 employees globally. And then your, your own team, maybe, you know, 12, 15 people, and then your regional organization, 1,300, and then globally is 130,000. And then you kind of see how you can grow and what, what the scale look like at the very end. Um, and it's, it's a different organization every time. So being able to reshuffle every time is kind of like reassembling the organization while it is alive. And if everybody's kind of in agreement, then it's much easier. But of course, more often than not, you would have first time founders who have never uh, seen what scale looks like or people who have seen what scale looks like have never built companies. And there's this dissonance between them and then it creates a lot of pressure. So, and it, that leads to a lot of mistakes. That's why I wanted to kind of mention that before so that we kind of creating this awareness uh, is, is, is one of the key aspects because it helps to kind of lead to answers more, more quicker. So, but in terms of mistakes, uh, yeah, I've made plenty. Uh, I think that's one of the key drivers for myself uh, is to help uh, founders to avoid 
those mistakes. Of course, mistakes will be made along the way, but you know, we'll work on, on, on fixing them. And uh, when I speak from purely a Nordic Ninja perspective, we invest predominantly in three themes, uh, deep tech, climate tech, and digital society, and, uh, and those topics um, tend to require, particularly in deep tech, quite a strong engineering skill set. And luckily for us, I've never seen uh, a problem with engineering quality here in the Nordics or the Baltics or Northern Europe, for that matter. But what happens really often is that the, we, we have this pathological problem of, of not having uh, a commercial stack of that team uh, being on the same level as the engineering or the product team. And that's been evolving, you know, Skype led the way, and then after that we've learned quite a lot. And, uh, uh, and I think that one of the most uh, big biggest problems that I've seen is that the founders struggle with is like, you know, they're being sent very different signals. It's like, you know, Premature scaling is one of the biggest problems, clearly, uh, before you have a product market fit. But then there are these questions like, should I hire a business uh, developer or a salesperson before I have a product market fit? When is that? Uh, you're being told that go and sell your products yourself before you hire somebody. But then in, in some cases, you would never be able to sell it. Depending on the domain, there's no silver bullet. It can be a particular company that where you can. Uh, but you always have to ask yourself, if you're an engineer, and you're hiring for somebody in like VP of sales, for instance, is this person at the same level in their domain as, as my you know, uh, chief engineer, for instance? And that's a really important question to ask yourself because too often kind of you, you discount when you hire for the commercial stack or we see that founders discount for the commercial stack in, in deep tech. So that's one thing I want to kind of definitely clear out. Mm -hmm. I think maybe another example of that is is in a very early stage of the company, if you have two girls and an idea, and you start building uh, something, then basically the people you can hire are the fools that are willing to work for free, or, or like, like whoever can you, you can get to help yourself. And, and once you get funded, and, uh, and once you start growing it, get to product market fit, like there is this moment where, like kind of in, in the beginning, in the very early days, it's okay to get by with what you have, and just accept the reality, and sort of build around the people that you have. But at some point, the company, when scaling, needs to grow, uh, go from looking at their people to looking at their roles. So very often you would see like a, I don't know, 50, 100 person organization, which is still trying to optimize, creating something to do for that person that they have. But at some point, like I think accepting that, okay, now we're, we're going to scale this. Now we need people who have done this, that, or the third thing before. We need somebody to run sales, not because they were there in the first week of the company, but because they've sold to that segment before. And sort of accepting, and that's very, very hard because it's also, uh, founders have tons of loyalty towards their early team, and, and it's very natural that they are trying to create an environment where the people can continue. But the reality is that not everybody that you have in the company in the first week will, will scale with a company to 100 or 1,000 people and still have like a useful thing to do. And actually, actually separating these people roles, th thinking which roles do you need, mapping that landscape out, making a plan for that, then seeing which internal people map to those roles and then actually agreeing to, to de <laughs> the ones that don't have a role to depart with them and hire the new people that, that, that are fit for the next phase, I think is a tricky, tricky thing to manage. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that Sten mentioned the loyalty because I think that's, that's something that has a kind of a, there's a misconception there uh, that, you know, when you think about loyalty from an ego perspective, then yes, it's loyalty to that particular person or their role, uh, when in fact, when you think about the company, you know, you want to make sure the company succeeds at the highest level. Uh, and uh, like you think about, is this the number one team in the world? Just happens to come from from like Estonia or, or the Nordics. And, and if you compare that to uh, uh, a team sport, you know, you, you definitely want to have the best players on your team. And, uh, and so the loyalty should be to that mission, to that w winning of that team in, on the global scale. And so you can be loyal to that mission and still remain in the organization. And you know, when we help companies to think about their executive teams, so it's really important for you to kind of let go of your ego 
and, and think about that. Am I, if I would reapply for this job, would I get this job? You know, I really like what Ben Horowitz says, uh, this, this mental model that you, know, you kind of have to think about this as I'm reapplying for my job every 18 months in a way. And can't, would, am, I, am I really competitive in this scale of this company? Um, and so we have been quite successful when uh, we, we've kind of uh, helped founders to, to build out their executive team from that perspective. You know, if a first time founder engineer, when they feel like they are not up to par, you bring in a CEO or a CFO or a CPO, and obviously it creates a lot of different kind of uh, tension, but if everybody is aware of, of where this company is going, what is great, what does great look like? Their founders are still the biggest shareholders of the company, so why wouldn't you hire somebody that helps to, you know, work for increasing your share of the value, uh, value of your shares? So. so how do you go about building and leading executive teams uh, from your own experiences? Well, I, I think there is the scaling on a company level and then the scaling on a role level. And I think the, the, if you think about what an executive does, and Again, one confusing thing is that tons of startups have like three or four or five C-level people <laughs> when they have three or four or five people. <laughs> and and then, then executives do something different. But if you, what an executive does at the scaling company, let's say 100, 200 person plus, is basically you hire executives to do a limited number of really good decisions. And a bad executive is the one that does a high number of low value decisions. Basically, it's the micromanagement, it's sort of trying to land grab, grow your domain, sort of get involved in everything and not deliver sort of the things that actually matter to the company. And that is, I think, very often the source why internally, growing executives internally is super hard. And like, I think, uh, I think we have a lot of sort of uh, public biases as well, because especially when, you, when it comes to founders, like everybody knows the Mark Zuckerbergs of this world, but they are rare, rare exceptions. Like there are not that many people on this planet who have gone from the early days of a startup to running a big public company and continuously the same person scaling their skills and learning to delegate and giving away. And, and especially like in a startup setting, like if somebody from internally grows with a team and remains an executive, like it's super hard to let go because you know where the systems were built that way. You know how this sort of customer came about, like you have all the relationships, all of that. So actually, uh, the other way to, uh, that I think about that is that uh, uh, like if you promote somebody into more, uh, more, more sort of uh, 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 leadership positions, it could be that uh, an engineer becomes a team lead or a team lead becomes a director level and has a few teams and then becomes the VP engineering and like kind of like this growth, then, then the, the main deliverable of that person changes. Like when you're an engineer, then you ship code. Like working code in the end of the day is your product. When you're a director or above, then your, uh, your, your uh, work product in the end of the week is a happy and performant team that ships code. Like, like, and giving up this sort of, and especially with engineers, it's very like you love being hands-on in, in some of this stuff and giving up and delegating and letting people to m make mistakes and gr helping them grow as, as uh, individuals. That's, that's your job now. And some people want to do that, some not. And I think that is this sort of the background sort of process that opens up this need for, uh, for external hiring executives. And, and I fully agree with, with some things that Rainer already actually said. Uh, like definitely Northern Europe and Europe in general uh, lacks everything go to market related. Uh, like the engineering skills are way stronger than, than sales or, or marketing skills. And, and that is changing by decades. Like you, can't do, like you have to have people who have been through a few stories as an employee watching what great looks like and then at the same time are able to innovate and then that becomes in, like a new leader a, in a field. Uh, and the other thing I think is the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, culture, risk of breaking the culture when you bring new people in, uh, like people who have seen scale like don't know the history and sometimes you bring in new executives to change the culture of the company and sometimes you bring in new executives uh, to fit the culture of the company, uh, depending on how happy you are with the culture for the next phase, and, and recognizing that ahead of the hiring process and understanding that what are you going to actually solve for and how much conflict are you willing to create in this sort of cultural sense and do you need somebody who has managed through that change before? And this becomes sort of this kind of non-functional requirements for that role. One of the interesting things is, is that when you uh, compare, um, let's say, young founders, first time founders discussion about how you build an executive team as the company's growing, you are in hyper growth mode, but you know, you, 
when somebody's doing it for the first time versus for the end time, the discussion is, is vastly different. And, and, and uh, even in that case, uh, if you work with a highly experienced uh, management team uh, and then still build out an executive team or a bigger team, the, the, the conversations of how you hire or what you hire for are, are, are complicated. Um, and it's, it's even more complicated when you do that with first-time uh, founders. And so we have uh, one company uh, called Vario, which is a, a mixed reality um, uh, company out of Finland, uh, a mixed reality headset at a human eye resolution, and that has a team that's probably the most professional team in our portfolio with Microsoft and Nokia backgrounds at, at the highest level, moving extremely fast. And then you see how the the, the kind of Annie Duke's uh, concept of universalism comes to, to play where the experts are experts because they are able to see all the different facets of a particular problem. N uh, not because be, they've been doing this for a very long time, but because they see all the simple, small things that a first-time person or, or, a, or, or a beginner would never bother with. Why are you talking about this in so, so small concepts? But then, then you really make that difference, you hire for like a great cloud uh, architect and, and really hunt them down, you know, and, and, and then it makes all the difference in the world. And, and then you see what great looks like, right? And then sometimes you find uh, teams that have been struggling for years and then explosion happens and then it's in hyper growth mode. And then of course, the experience there is that they haven't gone through the hyper growth mode, but they have gone through all the other problems that so they never want to go back. So they're more adaptable to, to make great uh, fast decisions. Yes, I'm looking at yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so it's really easy to talk about some stories without mentioning the names. <laughs> but we see quite often the struggle of founders. Um, uh, they're coming to us uh, with the need of hiring people and uh, like let's talk about uh, smaller, uh, smaller startups like 20 people, 50 people yeah. and uh, like ex especially executives. They want someone who has done already the same thing, who has seen the scale. But the thing with that is uh, when they actually join, they're not motivated anymore to do the same things. They don't want to be anymore. Like in the beginning, you have to be more hands-on and then you have to grow as a person. So yeah, like I want to hire um, the C-level person for the um, CPO position who has been in WISE or Google or whatever, and, uh, and we hire them and they don't succeed. So how do you see that? Um, because you mentioned that you, like, you have to bring in some people, but maybe they don't have this inner drive anymore or motivation to build it again. Yeah, I think I think that's a fair thing. I've seen that um, it's highly dependent on the person, and, and I think the first thing you need you need to really have the strong click of that new person with the mission of the company. Like, if you don't have that, like, like you can't have higher guns at a twenty-person company. Like, there needs to be like a deep sort of alignment of what you're trying to create, or what's the change that you're creating in the world. I think what uh, and and usually like a C-level executives, like typically they have like two or three goes in them before they want to. I don't know, retire, <laughs> drink wine. Uh, but the, what, what usually helps is that with this sort of switch to a smaller company in an early stage, you, for that person to make up uh, the, like a step up in the title. And by title, I also mean the sort of role of responsibility, <laughs> not just the, the thing on the business card. But, but basically, if somebody used to be a VP engineering in a previous company, they can join a startup and become the CTO because they want to be in that, like they were reporting to one, but now they want to sort of uh, have that full, full uh, ex accountability experience. It works especially well. It's like an oil machine if you look at enterprise sales in the US. It's like there are like stables of salespeople. Like there is like this person in Cisco in like 89 or 94 was running sales that way. And there's like a continuous thread of people, who, somebody who was a salesperson then, then they became a regional sales manager and then they became a, like a director or something, then they became a VP in the next company. So they've been for five companies. Every time they hire also the people they used to work with before because they all use the same sales playbook. They use Salesforce exactly the same way. They know what these labels mean. And there's like a culture and there's like a few dynasties of salespeople. So it's kind of like if you're in a 20-person company, when you're hiring that first sales leader, you're basically choosing 
which methodology you're going to be using for the next five or ten years. And if you talk to people who have run sales, then they can pretty easily say that, okay, looking at your company and the market you're selling, you should probably go down that path and try to get one person from those companies because that's the culture you want. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Europe is way away from that. Like, like that sales function in itself is weaker, yeah. and and the sort of clarity of disciplines doesn't exist. And you have to do much more work on a yeah. individual level, and you see way less people moving in flocks. Uh, like you hire that sales leader, and then they start a process of hiring salespeople in the market. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely agree with that. And and uh, to add, uh, one of the um, mistakes that we also see uh, teams do is that they they hire logos mm -hmm. you know you're, you're like oh this is ex Google or ex Twitter or whatever but then they're 56 thousandth person so it's it's not about that logo uh, sometimes you find somebody that comes from a so to speak uh, no-name company you never heard about but they're absolutely the best in what they do and then if your companies uh, building something worthwhile, if you're really building something that has a purpose, uh, it, it, it probably is something new that people have not done before, in that way at least. And that means that your questions also become to that executive, is that, okay, you're, this is a person that has seen going from, let's say, 20 to 100 or 100 to 500, and you're always hiring to that perspective, by the way, you're hiring for the road ahead, uh, not for the road that's behind you. But then you'll, you know, like, are they a fast learner? Because they're going to do something that they have done before, but in a completely new environment. Maybe it's a new uh, industry. Maybe it's a new business model. And are they a fast learner? So it's, uh, it's sort of like this uh, uh, comparison that I like to bring, which is like if you're, if you're like, uh, you know, Usain Bolt, you work really hard, but you're also extremely talented. Maybe in order for you to win that first spot, you've not worked as hard as the person who placed second, who came all the way from, you know, formerly placed 18 and worked their butt off to get to the second rank. And so you kind of have to really be aware of, of the hiring, that what are you hiring for, who are you hiring? And that's really important, so stay away from just you know, logos, just because it sounds sexy. Yeah, uh, that reminded me of a story. Uh, the, um, the other type of, one is logos, the other one is titles. Mm. Like some titles have been very much evolving, especially in Europe. Uh, product manager is a typical one. Like in late 2000s, like people were interchangeably using product manager, project manager, what's the difference? Like, like whatever title you want, like we'll hire it. So in the early days of Skype, like all the engineering was here and nobody in Estonia had really been a product manager in a software company. So, okay, we, we decided we need to build out that function in London. And we did two things, like first of all, you hire a bunch of product managers who thought that Estonia is a cheap place that software writing was outsourced to, not that where the company comes from, so there's a cultural issue. But also, like we hired people, uh, okay, that person was a product manager in, in MSN Messenger, that person was a product manager in ICQ, and uh, like, some of, the, some of these like, people had massive influence um, at Skype and they were sort of culturally very well fit and they actually did the job well in the end. But what we didn't get was that if like, uh, somebody was a Microsoft product manager in Germany in year 2005, they were localizing what was built in the US to German. So not a single line of code was written in Germany for that product. So they had a product manager title because they were responsible for localization of that product uh, and it was like a different language. And we thought that, okay, now we, we imported some very experienced skills of big company product manager and there was none of that. They were learning at the job kind of as we did as well or what they had seen other people do in the US before. So, so that was like, I think, very uh, so something that I've seen repeat as well is like this, uh, I don't know, you go to LinkedIn and you, you build your pipeline based on the uh, search of titles, whereas actually you should be building a, uh, your pipeline based on the verbs in the past tense that are on the CV, not the titles, right? So I have done X, I have scaled this, I have sold that. Like that these are the words that you're looking for, but people are, are getting stuck on this sort of metadata that is e easy to filter by. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at your own sort of portfolios, can you give some indication of behaviors or decision-making processes that the most successful companies are using and doing? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'll, just for the sake of time, have to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe one company that I really would like to uh, bring up here, uh, 
is, is a Swedish company called Einride, uh, uh, which, which is uh, developing autonomous electric trucks or a freight system, transportation as a service. The reason why I want to bring them up is that we invested in them. Uh, we discovered them wa wa in through the KTH alumni network, and, uh, and it was a team, uh, half of the team came from the Volvo self-driving uh, division uh, for the Volvo trucks. So there's a clearly there was no way for them to build this company, and, uh, and they, they were just a very small team, um, and we invested in Series A, uh, co-led this round, and, and now this is uh, a unicorn and uh, one of the fastest uh, growing companies in, in the, that domain in the world. And so they, they are reminding me of like, you know, w when we talk about an organization that's, you know, reassembling themselves, you know, every, you know, six months or what, you know, what have you, in my opinion, that's a company that's reassembling themselves every month because they're moving so fast, they're making the right decisions, they're, they have the right uh, executives in place, they've changed these executives, they've built those products, they've been able to fundraise which is a very important trait, by the way, you know, are, are you fundable as a founder, but also from an investor point of view, is this founder able to fundraise and hire and recruit? So they do all these different things uh, in the right way. They really, as Sten mentioned earlier, they focus on the few right decisions, and then they, you know, they hire the right people, they onboard the capital, they focus on sales, <coughs> and then everything else is taken care of. I mean, it takes care of itself, sounds really vague, but you will have the right people in place to do that work, perform that function. And, uh, and it's just been, you know, uh, a wonder to, to, to look at that company evolve over the last uh, four or five years. And, and you would never think it's uh, just a five-year-old company. And, and they're not, you know, it's, it's hard where you have, you know, trucks on wheels. It's, 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 it's massive uh, as an undertaking. So. Just, just beautiful to watch, and I think this is not the question you asked, but I just want to point this out that it's an interesting aspect to look at Sweden in the sense that they have a really mature corporate culture, and there's a mature uh, startup culture, and there's obviously sometimes some tension, but there's a healthy understanding that there's it's a cycle. You always have to innovate. There's builders, and then there's the ones that maintain the status quo and creates jobs for the masses, and then you kind of go through that cycle. We in Estonia never had that when we became free. We didn't have a corporate culture, so we have tension. So the, the older guard definitely does not like the startup uh, for ecosystem and vice versa. And because we don't have that historical continuity, unfortunately, but we need to build for that. And we always, when we kind of uh, become older, we need to keep that in mind that it's all about, it's, it's a re rejuvenating cycle. It's really important, and I think Einride is um, the embodiment of that. So yes, you want to create something new, but not because you're, you hate the old guys, but because something needs to be done in order to improve a particular situation in the world. Anything to add, Sten? No, I was thinking of the old guard, young guard <laughs> thing. The, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, think, I think we're getting to a point where it's about to change, because if you are, let's say, if you're a Estonian government, you want to get input from the largest employers in the country. Bolt-wise. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I mean, the, the places where thousands of people work every day and who are exporting and who are growing the fastest, like we have this corner of the economy uh, that is growing 10 times faster than Estonia, typically, or European countries, typically, right? So, so it's like that has closed that gap pretty well, and I think that has created more dialogue and more collaboration and more, more discussions, and, and people who built companies in the 90s are angel investing now and sort of trying to contribute with their knowledge, which is especially like, hardware is a great example. Like any Estonian startup that starts building something with the hardware eventually will need to figure out how do you fund inventory. <laughs> like it's, it's like there are people in the country who have done that several decades. <laughs> so, so that's very helpful to, to, to have this sort of, uh, uh, that's an example of executive hiring where you can bring in skills from people who, who wouldn't have been a st good startup employee, uh, but, but are massively uh, able to contribute in sort of the scaling phase and, and bringing this manufacturing supply chain uh, Financing, like startups usually raise money to equity, but if you're building something with a lot of physical components, you need to figure out how do you work with banks? What's a, 
what's a mezzanine loan? Like nobody, nobody knows. Like <laughs> in, in this sort of early stage yeah. startup crowd. So, so where do you get the people who do that? The other uh, function where I've seen that happen quite successfully is finance. Like uh, people who built an amazing career in in corporate finance or or worked for one of the big banks, which. Uh, as banks in Estonia have had very strong sort of ethical corporate cultures around the numbers are have been very very sort of well kept always because of the Scandinavian ownership and these other things. So bringing more people from that those experiences to help startups who are usually very messy and their budget is maybe a bad spreadsheet, but like to to bring sort of discipline and visibility and and sort of pres precision to numbers, it's is another example where you can sort of cross pollinate from this. Uh, uh, other fields. It's a pro tip right now, so <laughs> everyone starts hiring from <laughs> banks now. <laughs> yep. uh, you've mentioned the importance of having the right people at the right stages and also like moving these people at the right times a few times. Um, so how do you spot when a person isn't growing with the company uh, and what do you do about it? How do you build that relationship of trust where you can even have those difficult conversations? Yeah. Mm. It's it's easier to spot that when the company is growing, but the person is not growing. It's it's harder to spot that when the company is not yet growing, and then you have this question as whether there's something, you know, with the person or the leader or or lead the leadership in general or or with the business model or the products. So it's, that's harder. Uh, so let's focus for a second when we, as we are talking about scaling. So when companies are growing. Uh, it's quite easy to, to spot when somebody's not delivering or is struggling. And it's okay to struggle, but then you develop, and you know, it's, 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 we're not machines, we're sort of also cyclical beasts. And, and, but once you spot that, then you have to have a very honest conversation. And, uh, and uh, we have had one really good experience uh, with uh, a portfolio company, uh, a mutual portfolio company, the Logmore in, in, um, in Finland which is uh, providing condition monitoring systems uh, for perishable products like uh, food, pharma, electronics, things like that. And during the pandemic, they were growing extremely fast because they would provide the condition monitoring system for COVID vaccines, which have to be you know, under 70 degrees centigrade for, for Pfizer, for instance. And, and there it's easy to spot that, hey, like we're growing so fast, it's, 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 not, you know, it's not working. And, and then we had a really nice conversation with, with the three founders who all agreed we need to bring in more, more help. Uh, and, uh, and so we were able to bring in uh, a CEO, a CFO, a CPO, and even a general counsel because a lot of these pharma agreements are quite complicated, so you would have an in-house uh, counsel. And uh, this doesn't happen overnight. It, it took us almost a year to fill those for positions, but the way the founders, once they realized that this is required, the way they kind of removed the, their ego and, and really thought about this as shareholders, that was pretty fascinating. And, 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 and they stepped up and they have been able to learn from these new executives as well. So, I think the other thing is, um, Obviously, and I think ha it's easier to have these honest conversations if you build that into a culture early on, yeah. like regular feedback loops and, and goal setting and sort of, like if, if the first conversation is that you're already failing, then you're doing it wrong, kind of like you sh should have had a few, you're doing it right conversations yeah. if the person is still there years later. Right? Uh, but the, um, uh, I think the other one uh, to add uh, might be uh, bringing in fresh lens from outside. Um, so, in case of a startup, like if a CEO is trying to manage with a team and there's tons of legacy and they, there is a reason why things are like they are, like for example, the moment when there is a new board member that joins or like somebody who can get a little bit hands-on for a while and look at things and then give like honest, unbiased feedback that okay, looking at the company from outside, I think this thing is lacking and that thing is broken and that person is not the best of the market. Like, like uh, and, and that can, I think give sort of additional uh, confidence for, for the CEO to sort of figure this stuff out or, or start acting on it because like getting that reflection. Uh, and the other thing that has been, uh, has been uh, there's one company where, where we are working with somebody who came in as an interim or a consultant. So we know that we need to get the go-to-market function on the next level. Founders agree, CEO knows. CEO uh, has been a technical founder who has been build building this company for seven or eight years. Um, they have never worked for a, let's say, a 
successful enterprise sales company in the US. So they've, in a way, they've never seen what great looks like. And so bringing somebody in who is not going to be the permanent commitment that that's the new executive that does that, but somebody who comes in for three months or four months and helps to build a plan, like what kind of roles do we need? What are the questions do we need to solve? Um, what is the role description of the people that we want, want to hire full time is super helpful. And then who knows, maybe the plan comes out in a way that there are some internal people that can be mapped to those roles, but maybe they're not. And, uh, and that sort of, that eases the conversation a little, little bit um, uh, that otherwise would be that, okay, the, the founders, like there's always the reason to, a hundred reasons to not make changes as well, because tactically or in the short term, balls start falling to the floor, like there is, things that break and, uh, and, uh, and so, so that's an incentive why founders always postpone these conversations, but uh, having a plan of what you're going to do next makes this all faster. Let's talk about advisors. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, like most of the startups, they, they, they have advisors because they cannot hire a lot of people, they need some additional help. Um, and especially when you have a good brand also, like you get easily maybe the advisors, but what to do when the advisor is not bringing any value for the company anymore? Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, fire them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I but think I, I have think the that like part well of your company. Well, yeah, exactly. So the, I would, I would bring in a couple of examples and then, and then you probably have more to add, uh, just very easy off the bat. One is that the best kind of an advisor is the one who has also skin in the game. <laughs> you know, like let them invest, I don't know, 50K, whatever they, they have, maybe less, if, if they have less, whatever, and then they want to help. They will have an objective reason to help rather than give them some random obscure percentage, which is really hard to measure. Uh, and, and of course, our markets have become much more mature here in the, in the Nordics and the Baltics in the last decade, right? But it used to be also quite like a cowboy thing to do. And if you go to Latin America to today, it's like sometimes you see like some advisors have a bigger share than the founder and it's kind of, and it's a complete wild, wild west, wild south, west, whatever. <laughs> um, so that's, that's clear, let them invest. And the other one is that uh, don't make these long-term uh, commitments with advisors, make them short-term, really short-term. Um, and that's like in the very beginning, like you can always renew. How short? I don't know, six months, 12 months. I don't think you need to have like four year vesting type of thing with an advisor. That's like your, your, your company is three months old. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, so that's, that's clear. When you're uh, a bigger company, obviously, I know we spoke earlier about building an executive team reassembling companies, you, you may bring in an independent advisor to the board or independent board member as an expert in that particular field, things like that. So like nothing is permanent. Everything is kind of always changing. Obviously you have people who are there, but you always have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, what do you want to achieve? Uh, and, and I think the advisors, if they're not being valuable, then you know, they're going to become a ballast. You don't want that. Then do you want to add something? Yeah, I think there are many, many formats. Like I, I think advisor is too broad. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the um, like if you if you have a company that like it makes sense to have uh, like let's say if you have a deep tech product and you have a scientific advisor somewhere, or if you have a customer advisory board where there are people who are paying you money but you create the format to, to listen to them, yeah. <laughs> or you have somebody that you bring in to help fix your organizational processes or build up your recruitment function or whatnot, then, then I think these are very different categories and I, I, I think some of those clearly apply. I think yeah. ti time boxing everything is a very, very good idea. Uh, I also see the best board members usually, like let's say independent board members that you invite, they try to time box. Like, like people whose time is very valuable are not going to commit to being with you for the next decade, but they say that, okay, I'm going to join your board for the next 24 <laughs> months and then we'll see, like there is a cancel date. And that's very healthy and professional CEOs that are not founders, but operator CEOs do that always as well. They want time box contracts because that's a opening for both sides to see if it's still working. Um, and, uh, and I think depending on what you want to get out of those people, if there is like a specific deliverable that you need, then going around that deliverable and like talking about output, not process, I think is logical. Mm -hmm. uh, and in other cases where you want the constant feedback loop, I think uh, sometimes 
like not dealing with them individually, but sort of grouping them up, and that's what advisory boards, customer advisory boards, like like having a cycle where you like once a quarter or once in a half year get a few people at the same table because you probably get more value if they argue about some things mm -hmm. as well, and sort of giving them good meals and sort of that yeah. that sometimes gets you more value out of that relationship actually. Uh, next pro tip, like meals and bring people together. Always meals. Always. <laughs> Okay, um, let's talk about uh, founders and uh, CEOs of the companies who are usually the same people like the founders, they are become the CEOs of the companies. Uh, when they start, uh, they need to be hands-on hustlers uh, who can do everything, uh, but when growing, the role itself uh, evolves as well. So what are the main mistakes uh, founders are doing when company uh, grows? Then? Mm, I think some of the ones that we discussed earlier about executive teams also apply to the founders. But I, it's also, I, I think, maybe as a perception or a culture, there is like, um, there are founders who want to be the CEO because they, they have this perfectly clear vision of what they want to build out of this company and they have a plan and they have the energy and all that. But there is also, like sometimes founders who think that the society expects them to be, be CEO, that that's the self-worth is attached to that title kind of. And, and actually, I think uh, as with any executive or any employee, like having this sort of maybe every 18, 24 months to think about like, are you, like what <coughs> I was saying before, are you the right person for the space of the company and do you actually want to do this job? Like I've seen some founders who have switched to <coughs> sort of domain specific uh, roles and, and hired a really great CEO and they're the happiest people ever. Like they can do what they love and they can like, I don't know, like somebody who wants to build uh, great products doesn't have to go and fundraise and deal with all, all that mess. So, so, so there is like, um, uh, like I think the self-reflection and honesty about that and having great advisors and mentors and board members and people who are, uh, can have that conversation uh, with you in a sort of a safe and non-hostile way. Uh, like that's, that's yeah. something that, that, that being an investor somewhere, uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to have those conversations because it's like, uh, like the in incentives can be misaligned or like if somebody, like let's say if an investor shows up and asks, do you want to be the CEO? It sounds threatening, right? <laughs> but, but if there are people who are more neutral about the situation and, uh, and uh, that has worked quite well. So very often I think founders who are growing to managing like a few hundred people team, then you see them sort of having a coach or having yeah. a mentor. Yeah. I definitely agree. I think your, your self-worth should be in any for anybody actually, not just CEOs. Your self-worth should be tied to the best possible decisions that you can currently make, not your you know, title or, or whatnot. Um, and so like the biggest failure in life is if you don't act according to the best of your knowledge. And so I think there are, having said that, I think there are very few individuals who can go from, you know, a 10-person team to a 130,000-person team, and you withstand all the uh, challenges, and you're growing as a person, and you do that for like 20 years. There are very few people like that, and so it's perfectly okay. So um, I think it's uh, uh, yeah. W since we are talking from you know 10 to 100 persons, right? So these there there are very typical mistakes, clearly, right? So not recognizing. Uh, the company's uh, situation, not hiring, not stepping away, like not letting go of your ego, not recognizing that the company has made some mistakes, uh, uh, waking up too early, or you know things like that. So, so usually when companies fail, it's it's really easy to to see what where the mistakes were were made. So, uh, I think there are books and books and books about this particular topic from, from 10 to 100 when it comes to CEO uh, leadership failures. Yeah, the, the three bullet sum summary is you basically as a CEO you need to do three things. Yeah. You need to have cash in the bank account, you have need to have right people in the seats and you need to give them direction like where, yeah. you are, where you're running yeah. and that's it. Yeah. And like as a founder who has been used to doing everything, like yeah. it's super hard to actually back away yeah. from like yeah. letting them operate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you do all that in the right way, you are in a way, you know, allowing everybody else to do their, their job. Sounds so simple. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like <laughs> so simple. Uh, but uh, have you had those discussions with yourself uh, or with some coaches, mentors, advisors uh, when you were uh, as a CEO, like 
am I uh, the correct person uh, for at this point? Have you had this? Uh, yes, y you, you uh, definitely uh, ha want to have these conversations, right? Uh, maybe I wasn't so lucky in, in my <coughs> first and, and last endeavor uh, uh, with uh, alignment uh, when it came to all investors. Uh, investors also have to be aligned around like the common goal. With small details, that's a different story, but, but the common goal. And if you don't have alignment even among the investors, then there is like very difficult thing. So that's what I like about uh, uh, this situation right now and in, 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 uh, in also working with Sten uh, quite closely on many, many companies is that we have a mutual understanding of the path, and uh, you work with the founders to give you, to, to give them the best advice you can to avoid some of these mistakes. So you actually have been there, so that's that's super important. So alignment between investors and 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 the management team is is, is very important. You kind of, you know, you don't want to have people on the board who hate you. So. That's definitely not great. Uh, or, or, or you don't want to have investors who fight and, and you're, you're the CEO and you're watching this as a, as like a family, family affair, some sort of a fight. And, and you're like... These people you can't fire as well. Yeah, yeah. and you can't fire. Your <laughs> so, uh, well, you can't fire investors. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a very complicated uh, kind of dynamic. So, you know, building the cap table, building their team, these are the most important decisions, and and sometimes people discount just because they want to get funding. But I would say, yeah, let it die and start over. And just, uh, yeah, don't 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 uh, make the decisions that you already know in your heart will not work. Like there's no way this will be, uh, you know, a fruitful partnership. Yeah, in teleport, like in the seed phase of a company, like no matter how much you wish, you, you can't have <laughs> anybody else be the CEO. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you kind of have to. Uh, but I, I had this very distinct moment where I was selling Teleport to, to um, uh, move guys at the time, which later became Topia. And frankly, I didn't, in that conversation, I didn't worry about like, I'm not going to be the CEO moment at all. I was very focused, like my entire decision making of selling the company and staying with the acquirer was like how well I click with the founder of the buyer or the CEO of the buyer. Uh, can we have a very honest conversation about where our domains are and am I, am I happy with sort of the latitude and freedom to operate in my domain? And because of there, there was like a very clear like separation where, where uh, Bryn who was the CEO at the time uh, of Topia, uh, she came from a finance background like like knew the customer market extremely well, was building the sales organization and all of that. And I could basically come in with my team and take over all the product side and eventually the engineering and sort of became the CPO of that. I was actually very, very happy about it because, because Bryn was dealing with it. Like basically I went from a seed stage founder, could skip series A, series B fundraising, go out with Bryn and pitch the company together, raise series C yeah. and sort of like, accelerate, to skip a few years of development towards the vision and mission. And so, so I think that's, that was very, um, I felt that that was the right way how to unpack that, not to think about like the titles, but think about the substance first and the sort of the, is this what you want to do with your life? That's another thing is that the, if, you, if you are an early stage founder and you start something where you often there is this misconception that it's a few years of commitment. In reality, like, like the average n age of companies going public or exiting has been raising over the last decade or two even. So it used to be that maybe in seven or eight years you go public, now it's like 11, 12, 15 years, depending how complex thing you're building, it might be 15, 20 years of your life before it goes to fruition. Like that's a really long marathon. And like, do you really want to do the same job through all the scales and all of that? But for sure, if you're going after your sort of mission that you're super passionate about, you want to see the story succeed. So it's always like benchmarking, like what's, what's a good balance of your personal life goals and what you want to do with the days and, how do you balance your life with your family, which is kind of tougher for CEOs, uh, and and then then actually having the company succeed. So I, th yeah. I think it's it's this egoless looking things from afar, yeah. trying to observe more neutrally rather than. Yeah, I would I would also bring in like the market, <laughs> like sometimes uh, when you when you're building something, you have you know competition, and then. Y 
you know, as you pointed out, this, would you rather go through Series A, B, and really go for it and take on that risk that uh, that maybe somebody goes past you? I mean, it really that you have to really have conviction in your your ability, your team's ability to deliver and go faster every time you, you fundraise, uh, uh, or depending on the domain. Again, sometimes in deep tech, that's really like if you want to this. If you're really tied to the mission, if you want this mission, if you want to really help to change the world, sometimes like I had this conversation with uh, Tony Fidel, who is one of our investors at, at Planet OS, and he's the, he's the founder of, of uh, S Labs, co-founder, and, and his company got acquired by Google. And obviously, Tony would have been able to go and fundraise a lot and, and built a bigger company out of this, but it was like, okay, have, he's already been at Apple, you know, what scale looks like, you would be acquired, uh, uh, by Google, and that gives immediate scale, and, and then no competition will ever be able to kind of over, overcome uh, or surpass you. So you always have to factor that in as well. Like, where where is this field going? Um, is this what I, you know, created with the team? Can we really take it to the world stage? And if the answer is no, if I go through series A, Bs, and Cs, and I wind up last or somewhere in the middle, that doesn't matter anymore. So again, you've failed uh, maybe to you know, maximize your own share uh, value, but you definitely then can make decisions to maximize the impact of that product or, or service that you develop. So that's also another factor that you have to think about. Uh, maybe to, to balance and to say something, something sort of paradoxical or arguing against mm -hmm. ourselves, like, doesn't mean that uh, that actually having temporary CEOs is a good thing. Yeah. Like kind of like when when investing uh, yeah. at Plural, we still very, we are looking for companies that can potentially grow a hundred times, mm. and like the probabilities can vary, but like there's a credible path to 100x. And of course, you're trying to find a founder who can scale with that because changing a CEO is a pain. Like they think everything uh -huh. can go wrong, and finding the right person and culture clicks and like all of that is super super hard. So of course, you dream about it. So I think all these comments above are like if the CEO or the founder really feels that the time is right to change, uh -huh. then then that's fine. Mm -hmm. But we all dream and hope that the founders scale as far as they can. So the pressure is still on yeah. for the founders. Yes. They were already thinking that maybe they can go. First 100x you can. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, j just want to point out again, like one, one thing that's really important is that, you know, uh, we invest currently only in the Nordics and the Baltics and our, our population here is 33 and a half million people in those eight countries. That's still fewer people than in the Tokyo metropolitan area. <laughs> So you know, like our m there's no domestic market. It's 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 small. We have you know terrible weather, <laughs> obviously, and uh, and so you want to invest in teams that are able to scale globally. I mean, that's the only way you can uh, in in a VC economy, like from in and out. I think we've spoken too much as founders, but like <laughs> as investors. You, you want to invest in the best team in the whole world who just happens to come from this area. Uh, that, that's the only way. And then you factor in all those things that we spoke about, like what, is a, what, is, what does best look like? Why do we know they're the best? How can they continue? And, and so on. Okay, so we are actually almost out of time. But mm, befe yes. before we close, uh, one piece of advice in one sentence uh, for a founder to take away to think about to do. Mm -hmm. I have this uh, sentence that uh, you really have to ask yourself, do you want to win or do you want to be right? <laughs> and, and I really suggest you want to win. <laughs> uh, and, and in order to help you to win, I, I really suggest, since we are talking about people, mm -hmm. I, I really uh, recommend you to read this book by Claire Johnson called Scaling People by, uh, from Stripe Press. Thank you. Then? Okay, if we're going into dualities, like <laughs> that reminded me, uh, there is a great book called Founders Dilemmas uh, by Noam Wasserman. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Harvard researcher that's, uh, that has taken many of these paths. Like he's basically, the theme is that uh, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king? <laughs> like, uh, like you can't be both. Like do you want to maintain maximum control or do you want to create a delegating organization and have co-founders and all of that, which reduces the slice but makes the pie bigger. And so he has go gone and researched like tens of thousands of US venture funded companies and quantified like all the decisions, like solo founder, multiple founders, executive, this, that, like how the decisions you make and correlated that to the actual outcome. Like what's the valuation of the company on average? So super interesting. Thank you. 
Thank you for really insightful uh, discussion. I hope all the listeners got uh, good pro tips how to be more egoless and how to build and scale your company. So thank you and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.